live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Aw, how's it going, gentlemen? Welcome to yet another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay at Scott McKay on Twitter on TikTok and on True Social, Real Scott McKay on Instagram. You can find all the YouTube goodies by searching my name at youtube.com. The website is mountaintoppodcast.com. More on that later. And we're still building that cadre of like-minded men who are committed to getting better with women on Facebook. You can search that out and get on board at the Mountaintop Summit on Facebook. All right, gentlemen, I've got a brand new topic for you. We've done over 300 episodes of the big show here, and we have never discussed this before. I'm going to be completely honest with you. When we do shows about medical stuff and how you can't get it up and things like that, you guys tend to not download those episodes quite as much. Therefore, it's obvious they don't interest you as much. But when we talk about dating, when we talk about relationships, when we talk about getting better with women and getting the right women into your life while you guys download those things like a big dog. You guys are all over those shows. Well, today we're going to run a great experiment, and I'm looking forward to this because I talked to this cat quite a bit before we clicked record. He is a medical doctor. Yes, so we're going to get medical today, but he's actually what's called a regenerative urologist. That's his specialty. He's in San Ramon, California. He's the author of a book called The 21st Century Man, and our topic today is a medical doctor's take on how to be more attractive to women and have better relationships with women. So I want to welcome Dr. Judson Brandeis. Judson, how are you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing great, Scott. Thank you so much for having me on. I'll tell you what, this was an exciting conversation before we even started recording it. Your hometown team, the Golden State Warriors, just clinched their fourth championship in recent years. I think it's their fifth overall, right? It is, I think, seventh. Seventh. Yeah, okay. Well, excuse me. They go further back than I do, which uh, is getting harder to do lately, by the way. But uh, <laughs> you were telling me uh, that you have people associated with the Warriors and indeed uh, players even for the Niners and some of the other Bay Area teams come and visit you because of your expertise, and that's pretty exciting. So I wanted you to tell us what it is about your unique specialty that attracts guys who are looking to be at the top of their game. I think that's a pretty good way to ask it. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a fantastic way to, to ask it. And so I'm a urologist. I do clinical research. I've trained at some of the top institutions in the country. I've been voted the top urologist in the San Francisco Bay Area for the past nine years. And about three years ago, I dedicated my practice to regenerative urology. So helping men over the age of 40 really optimize their physical, hormonal, and sexual health. That's amazing. So talk to me about some of the typical treatments you offer, guys. Yeah. So we have a whole algorithm for helping men look better, feel better, and have better physical intimacy. So for example, for physical intimacy, for sexual function, you know, I have some guys who have difficulty getting an erection, but you were telling me that most of your most of your listeners are are you know, fairly decent in that department, but we can take good and go to great. Well, let me put it this way. I'm not sure exactly what's going on with the individual dudes in our audience. All I know is when we do shows about sexual stamina or having a harder erection or things that are associated with dick pill pitches, it just, it goes over like a Led Zeppelin. It doesn't Mm -hmm. go well. But when we talk about being better in the bedroom with women, on a more general scale, instead of keeping it granular to the medical piece, uh, it goes a lot better. And I know what you're talking about here is overall maximization. You're not trying to medicalize the social. You're simply put helping men be more sexually healthy and, well, better sexual athletes, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great term, better sexual athletes. I mean, I can, I can go from, from A to Z, but I want to do something that's most relevant to your, uh, to your listeners. And I think optimizing or creating better sexual athletes really is a good way to think of it, right? And so one of the first things to think about is if you're an athlete, like you're competing for the club tennis championship, when is the best time for you to 
play that tennis match? Is it 11 o'clock at night after you've had a big meal and a bunch of wine? Or is it during the day, you know, when you're better hydrated and you're, you're more clear and you haven't had alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, as we get older, 50% of men over the age of 50 will have some degree of erectile dysfunction. So 40% of men in their 40s, 50% of them men in their 50s, 60% of men in their 60s. So we're all victims of the aging process. And it's all sort of a natural process of slow decline. And so we have to think about how our sexual performance is as blood flow, as circulation. How can we maximize or optimize blood flow? Because if you do a good job with that, it's going to improve your sexual confidence and that's going to come out in bed and at the end of the day. All right. So let's talk about reasonable expectations here. Everything you said so far is wonderful. I love this topic of sexual athleticism. Sounds like a pretty clickbaity title. I think that's what I'm going to run with for the actual show. What is a reasonable expectation for when you're a young man, say late teens, early 20s, versus when you're, say, a 40-year-old man or a 50 or 60-year-old man in terms of, well, how horny you feel, uh, how many rounds you can go, how quickly you can get it up, how much of a load you can shoot. I mean, just riff on this. You're a urologist. You have no shame. So I'm just going to let you go after it. But give us an idea. Absolutely. There's, there's no shame whatsoever in what I talk about. So of course not. when you're 20, your testosterone should be at 1,000, right? Your, your uh, muscles are building. You have high libido. And every year after the age of 20, your testosterone drops about 1% or 2%. So that by the time you're 60, your testosterone's probably 400 or maybe 500. And that's going to affect your ability to build muscle. It's going to affect your libido, right? Now, that's not to say that you can't improve testosterone by taking testosterone, but that's just realistically where your libido is based on the natural decline in testosterone. Now, erections are slightly different, right? Erections are a function of blood flow. So if you take really good care of yourself, if your cholesterol is low, if you're exercising every day, if you're eating right, you know, then you can actually have really clean blood vessels and you can maintain really good erectile function into your 60s, into your 70s. I even have guys in their 80s who still have a very active sex life. So a lot of that depends on how you take care of yourself. Now, if you're overweight, if you're smoking, if you're drinking, if you uh, eat a diet that's really high in cholesterol and you're not taking a statin drug, then your erection, erectile function declines in your 40s or 50s or 60s. The fortunately, one of the reasons I went into regenerative urology is there are things that we can do now to help supercharge your erectile function and get you back to where you were when you were in your 30s or 40s. Okay, so if I'm a 50-year-old guy, and I could drop the hammer on my old lady twice a day and get it up. Am I doing pretty well? Or is that average? You are doing. Yeah, you're doing pretty well. Okay. So by the time a guy is 40, 50, there's typically a noticeable decline. I mean, I've heard some of these poor bastards, Dr. Judson, say, oh, man, guys, don't ever get married because by the time you're 36 or 37, you don't want any more anyway. And I'm thinking to myself, man, that's awful young. And I found myself single again at that age, and it wasn't the case for me. And I am now 55 years old, and I mean, I'm not trying to brag or anything. I'm just trying to gauge myself against some of the other guys out there. Because, listen, I'm no 55-year-old triathlete, but I still feel pretty sexually healthy. And I still don't have a whole lot of problem getting horny um, and having sex with my wife. It seems like it still comes pretty naturally. I'm pretty happy about that based on this anecdotal evidence other guys have given, but I wanted to hear from you what these reasonable expectations are. So if we're doing pretty well at that rate, then I guess that's at least a baseline, correct? Yeah. I mean, it is a baseline, but I, I think it's important to get a realistic gauge on what men's health is in the United States. So for example, 40% of men are fat or obese in the United States. And by the end of the, the decade, it's going to be 50%. I thought you were going to say by the end of this show, it's going to be even higher. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> I'm sitting here munching Twinkies over here. <laughs> You're doing the same. Yeah. You know, <laughs> half of men have high blood pressure. 
15% of men still smoke. 12% of men don't even have health insurance. And 100 years ago, women lived one year longer than men. Now women live five years longer than men. So I'd say on average, a lot of men out there have physical difficulties. And those physical difficulties manifest as erectile dysfunction. So one of the first things that goes in circulation is erectile function. Right. I've heard that before. One of the first signs that you're having perhaps a heart condition or you're starting to experience some form of atherosclerosis is that you can't get it up anymore. Is that correct? Exactly. So, yeah. you know, when you're in 20s, you get morning erections every day. Sometime in your 30s or 40s, you'll begin to lose your morning erections, right? And be that's because your Overall circulation- Overall only sometimes? Um, usually just sometimes. Okay. But, it, you know, it's a it's a gradual decline. But usually 10 years after you lose morning erections, you'll have a, 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 an epic fail with your, your partner, your spouse. And 10 years after that, you'll end up with some sort of cardiovascular disease, a heart attack, a stroke, an angioplasty, those kind of things. So erectile function is a really good indication of circulation. And that's a good wake-up call for your circulation isn't as good as it should be. And that's when you start to do something about it before it's too late. Now, that's all well and good, but there's a lot more to being a sexual athlete. And I'm sure you have a more generalist take on being sexually attractive to women, you know, well into your middle age and perhaps beyond than simply whether your dick's getting hard or not. Talk to me about alcohol and diets and how those factors not only affect our sexual performance, but our overall attractiveness, including including our appearance and our mood. I mean, obviously, we're going to get fat if we eat too much. Uh, we get bags under our eyes if we're drunk all the time. But what are some of the more subtle features of that that some guys might not be aware of? Yeah, no, those are those are two really important things, alcohol and food. And alcohol for me is four things. First of all, it's very much ingrained in our society. So, you know, when you're younger, you go to the game and drink beer. When you're older, you, you know, with your partner, you drink wine. When you're even older than that, you go out with your guys, you drink whiskey. But really, alcohol is three things. It's a depressant. So the class of medication or drug that it's in is a depressant. Second of all, it disinhibits you. So for some people, that's a really great thing. If they're shy or if they're inhibited or they're they're reluctant to do something, go up to a girl, then they'll drink alcohol. But at the, on the flip side, a lot of the stupid things that we do in life relate to alcohol consumption. And then the third thing is it's empty calories. So if you have two glasses of wine a night, every night for a year or two beers or two you know, glasses of whiskey, you'll put on about 25 pounds of extra fat. Man, that's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. And I, I'll sit here with my patients in the office and I'll have them take out their calculator on their iPhone and I'll have them do the math. And it just absolutely blows them away. Well, what about the red wine storyline though? If I drink yeah. a couple of glasses of red wine, I'll actually be healthier and lose weight like all the centenarians in Italy do. Yeah. Well, you know, they used to think Coca-Cola was really good for you. They used to have cocaine and Coca-Cola. And if smoking you look at, was good for you. <laughs> yeah, smoking is good for you. If you look at who produces those studies, it's the red wine industry. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like there's a supplement called maca, right? And people take maca. They think it's so great for them. Uh, but if you actually look at the studies, it's the studies are sponsored by the government of Peru. And if you think if you look at where maca is actually produced, it's Peru. That's so do you think that those were really uh, uh, double blinded, well controlled studies? No, of course not. I not mean, exactly. Let's objective. be let's be real. The there was an article in the Lancet, which is the biggest British um, journal, on sixty thousand people, and they looked at their drinking habits, and what they found is zero to one drinks a day didn't affect your longevity. If you'd had one or two drinks a day, you lost about a year of your lifespan. If you had two to three and a half drinks a day, uh, you lost about a year or two of your life expectancy. Over three and a half drinks, you lost maybe four or five years of your life expectancy. You know, it, it's really coming out now in the literature that no amount of alcohol is good for you. Wow. Yeah, it does appalling things to your system. I'm not telling people, you know, not to drink. I'm just, because I don't, that's not what I do with men. Because you can't tell a man what to do. If you tell a man, like, listen, dude, you got to stop drinking, he'll just look at you and say, screw you, I'll do whatever the hell I want. 
Right. I give people data. I give people facts. And then you make up your mind on your own. Now, you mentioned eating a lot of high cholesterol foods. I'll tell you, this is projection, obviously, but I can only speak from my own personal experience because I don't have a waiting room full of patients the way you do. But for me, it's not only the alcohol, but the carbs. If I start loading up on carbs and drinking alcohol three days from now, I'll feel like I'm 80 years old. If yeah. I kill the carbs and generally go on a keto diet and cut the alcohol out completely, Judson, I'll feel like I'm 28 again in 72 hours. It's like magic. So there's something to this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the thing is most people don't understand what carbs are and most people don't understand what keto actually is. And that, you know, it's very easy for them to get tricked, you know, buy keto this, buy keto that. Sure. You know, and I could easily, I can give you two, three minutes and you'll understand the whole thing. Well, go for it because I think a lot of guys are, are struggling with a body chemistry where they're, you know, perhaps insulin resistant, which is a buzzword nowadays. Yeah. And when told that, I mean, you're on the, you're on the track to becoming diabetic. Oh man. If you're diabetic, you're hosed. Yeah. And being a diabetic is a catastrophe. Yeah. Because diabetes blocks small blood vessels. Okay. Where do you have small blood vessels? Your eyes. If you block blood vessels in your eyes, what happened? You become blind. You have blood, small blood vessels in your vasculature, right? If you block the small blood vessels, you get high blood pressure. You have small blood vessels in your kidneys. Diabetics get kidney failure. You have small blood vessels in your penis. Diabetics get erectile dysfunction. You have small blood vessels in your feet. Diabetics get amputations because they get sores on their feet because they can't feel their feet because they get neuropathy because their nerves don't work down there, right? So then they're clumsy. They kick something. They get a sore on their foot. The, the sore doesn't heal. They get infected on their foot and they end up losing their foot. So the moral of that story is don't be diabetic. Yeah, don't be diabetic. <laughs> but we have a, a an epidemic of type 2 diabetes in yeah. this country. And it's because 40% of the men are obese or fat. Okay. Now, the thing is, fat in nature is really good. Did you ever see the TV show Naked and Afraid? I try to avoid it at all costs, but I've yeah, heard of it. It's a great show, right? So there's a hot guy and a hot girl, and they get sent off to the jungles of Belize, right, with a machete and a fire starter. And they record what happens for three weeks. And in those three weeks, usually the guys and the girls will lose about 20 pounds, right? Because in nature, in order to eat, you have to kill something or you have to find a fruit or a vegetable that's ripe. It's actually hard to get food in nature. Whereas, you know, in society, all we got to do is call up Uber Eats and we have a 2000 calorie burrito that arrives on our doorstep in a couple hours. And yet America is the world's worst place and there's never been a worse time to be alive, right? Well, no, I think it's <laughs> one of the greatest times to be alive. But I'm joking. It's just people, oh, okay. <laughs> people who are experiencing abundance tend to complain the most. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I know. continue. My, my 5G is so slow. <laughs> I know. First world problems. <laughs> yeah. Fat is a luxury, right? Animals that are fat are healthy, right? But humans that are fat, you know, are taking in too many calories. So, okay, what is a calorie? Calorie is a unit of heat, a unit of energy. And what is the source of all energy in the universe? The source of all energy in the universe is the sun, right? So the sun shines on the planet and the trees, right, have chlorophyll. They grab that energy. But what do they do with that energy? The way that they store that energy is they make a molecule called glucose, sugar, right? So they take carbon dioxide, they take water and they take this energy and they make glucose, right? But then you can't have so much glucose floating around. So what do you do? You make a carbohydrate or a starch. You take a bunch of those glucose molecules and you jam them into one big molecule. And then when you have a lot of those big molecules and you're an animal, right? So you got an animal that's going around and you eat fruit right? So that might be a glucose or fructose, or you eat a potato like a starch, which is carbohydrates. And when you have too much of that, your body says, well, we better store some because we don't know when the next time we're going to eat is. And so that's fat. So fat is just a very efficient storage form of energy. 
right? So if you're taking carbohydrates, it just overwhelming your body with glucose stores and carbohydrate stores, and but your body doesn't know that you're going to be able to eat in another three hours that you have a refrigerator, right? We didn't evolve with refrigerators. And so your body says, well, I better store this as fat. And if you keep eating carbohydrates, you keep making fat. Now, if you eat protein, protein is different. Protein is really hard to make into fat. And protein isn't a very efficient way of making, uh, you know, energy. Protein is good for making stuff like muscles and and cartilage and hair and DNA and those kind of things. And so that's why it's so much better to start by eating protein and try to fill yourself up with protein and avoid those carbohydrates. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think it pretty much goes without saying that if you're a fatter guy in the year 2022, we don't live in the Renaissance anymore where fat was beautiful because it was rare. Fat guys, uh, out of shape guys are no longer in this day and age sexually attractive to women, you know, assuming they ever were. I mean, we go back to the Romans and the Greeks and look at all their statues and those guys all had six packs too. You know, they look like our modern day athletes. So health is sexy to women at any age because women need to feel safe and protected. And if you're a guy who's on death's door, obviously you're going to suck at all that. It's primal, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the other thing is your body is really smart. Your body makes only as much testosterone as you need. So if you're a hunter out on the plains taking down buffaloes, you need a lot of testosterone. If you're a farmer tending the fields, you need testosterone, but not quite as much. And if you're a desk jockey sitting behind a desk, your body says, well, I don't need to make much testosterone. Nobody's attacking me. I don't have to kill something for my meal. And so your testosterone's low. And then on top of that, if you're fat, fat actually aromatizes testosterone meat, right? So it takes testosterone and it turns it into estrogen. That's why fat guys have man boobs. Yes. Also unattractive. Yes, I would say so. And then fat guys who are low on testosterone get cranky. And that's not attractive to women either because then suddenly you become an emotional threat to them rather than being an agent for calm and safety and security and making women feel better about the situation they're in. I mean, cranky guys don't have much of a sense of humor and having a sense of humor is like catnip with women. So really, we're losing all of these things by not checking in with our health and and paying attention to it. So the question that has to come from that, Dr. Judson, is why are so many of us so complacent about these things that are exactly what would make us attractive? Is it all of the media blitz out there saying, hey, you know, you don't have to be tall, uh, handsome, uh, trim, young, or good looking. You just snap your fingers and whisper three little words into any woman's ears and she'll throw herself at you sexually. And so guys are thinking, this is a big, easy button. I can just coast through life. And, you know, that's not gender specific. Women are thinking the same thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, guys can just flip on pornography and, and fantasize that they're that guy. And they don't even need real women anymore. Exactly. It's pathetic. Yeah. It, you know, to me, it is, it is pretty sad. But I'm very hopeful. And I see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of guys in my practice and they're all really, really good guys. Guys have taken a beating lately, right? With the whole Me Too movement and, and Epstein and Weinstein and all that kind of stuff. But 99% sure. of the guys that I see in my office are really good guys. They work hard. Their heart's in the right place. They want to take care of their family. They want to do a good job at work. And I really help them perform better physically, mentally, emotionally, and sexually. And that's why I wrote The 21st Century Man is because I've really been blessed with an incredible education and I, I wanted to take everything that I knew and everything that 60 of my, my national expert colleagues knew and put it into one massive book to help men live a, a better and happier and healthier life. Now, your claim is this is the most medically accurate men's medical advice book ever written. Yeah, so it's 101 chapters. It's over 900 pages and it's written by myself and 60 of my physician and men's health colleagues. So, you know, I don't know that much about the heart. I don't know that much about eyes. So I have cardiologists and ophthalmologists 
uh, writing chapters, or I don't know that much about the hand, but you know, Greg Horner, who's a nationally recognized hand surgeon, uh, who's done the top uh, hand fellowships in the country, he wrote the chapter on hand health. Yeah, there are hand doctors. You know, obviously, we talked beforehand. You're an NBA fan, like I am, and I know Tony Parker struggled with hand injuries when he was the point guard for the Spurs, and he was going to this guy who specialized in hands and <laughs> fixing guys' hands. So I'm sure that's probably a guy like Horner. Might have been the same guy. Exactly. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because I think this is the question guys really want an answer to. You see guys come in and out of your practice all the time, Judson, and obviously they're getting results or they wouldn't be coming back. These guys who are big time and famous wouldn't be consulting you. What are the real results men get when they start living right? I mean, okay, let's say I go to the trouble of losing 50 LBs. I quit the alcohol. I get my testosterone in order. How is my life going to be better tangibly? And are these guys tangibly experiencing higher levels of attraction to a larger cross-section of women? Are their relationships with their wives and women tangibly improving? If so, how? Oh, it's I've seen guys just totally transform. I mean, every week, Almost every day we see someone just totally transformed in our practice. I mean, when you lose weight, you have so much more energy. I tell people it's like carrying around a 50-pound backpack every day. Your knees and your joints and your, your feet, you're exhausted. So when you lose that weight, you feel so much better. When you boost testosterone, it's like someone turned the light on in a dark room. You know, when you use low intensity shockwave therapy and a nitric oxide booster and PRP to improve erectile function, I mean, I have guys, there's not a week that goes by that someone isn't crying in my office, just either because they're so desperate or the flip side is they're so happy. I mean, I had a guy come in the other day, he hadn't had an orgasm in six or seven years. And with some of the technology that I have in the office, he was able to have three orgasms in one weekend. I mean, it's it's incredibly dramatic, the difference between when you don't take care of yourself and when you learn to take care of yourself and you take all the steps that you need to take care of yourself, not just physically, but also mentally, emotionally, in relationship, and also sexually. Yeah, I'm assuming that technology in your office was not Pornhub, correct? No. Okay. Just level setting there. Although I am I am a sexual wellness advisor for Pornhub. Fantastic. What does that entail? Yeah, you know, I make fully clothed educational videos. A That's friend so of mine fun. runs the there's actually a Pornhub wellness site, uh, which is, you know, totally clothed, totally legitimate, and provides really good uh, educational information for people that are on Pornhub. You know, we had a guy on about six or seven shows ago who does the naked, not safe for work version of that. It has millions of viewers. I thought yeah. that was interesting too. I guess there's a time and place for everything. Yeah, I don't think people would, I don't think millions of people would follow me if I didn't have my clothes on. Hey, you know, you got to walk the talk, Bubba. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you're just being humble. <laughs> All right. So enough about us. A couple questions here. You mentioned emotional health. And that's a place where guys really are extra careless in terms of our mental health, our emotional health. All of that's related. We think a lot about, you know, getting in better shape and being buff and looking good and feeling good. But we're infamous as men for just letting our emotions and our well-being just lapse into, I mean, the red zone. We don't need any help from anybody. We don't need to ask for directions. If we have a wife and kids and our family is in crisis, our wives may even expect us to shoulder that whole burden and be the rock of Gibraltar for the whole family. Meanwhile, we're dying inside. You know, meanwhile, the, the effects of stress are documented. You know, you talk about how men are dying younger than ever, and a lot of it is attributed to stress and us doing dangerous things and being lazy and sitting around and watching others live life on TV and eating fake food. And man, it just seems like there's this conspiracy to keep us unhealthy. How can we guard our mental and emotional health? And I understand that that's not your wheelhouse, but you probably still know more about it than the average Joe. So have at it. 
Yeah. So there are great sections of the book on mental health. Uh, so chapters on depression, anxiety, work-life balance. Uh, and there are great chapters, a uh, whole section on relationship skills also written by therapists and fatherhood experts. Uh, and there's an amazing chapter written by Susan Bratton, who's an internet sex expert. Uh, we on, know Susan. Yeah. I don't want to say intimately, but we know her very well. She's been <laughs> yeah. a friend of mine for 15 years and has probably been on this show three times now. But yeah, yeah. Sure, we know she, she wrote an amazing chapter called How to Please a Woman. Well, it is amazing to know how to please a woman. Yeah. And th there's another amazing chapter in the book written by a friend of mine who's a, a male gynecologist on uh, what men need to know about menopause. Which Fantastic. Is, yeah, it is. It's an amazingly well done chapter. And the thing is, like, say you're 55, your wife's 52, everything seems to be going well. Then one day your wife comes home and you're like, holy crap, who the hell is this? You know, this is not the wife that when that I went off to work in, in the morning and I came home to like a totally different person. <laughs> if you don't understand what's going on hormonally in menopause and you don't empathize with your spouse your relationship could go in a direction that you really don't want it to go. But if you actually read the chapter and understand what's going on with your with your spouse and understand the aging vagina, right? The vagina undergoes changes in menopause that really aren't favorable. But if you can talk to your spouse about maybe let's get you on some estrogen and maybe let's start using some, uh, some uh, silicone-based lubricant, you can save your sex life in your 50s and 60s and 70s. I think a lot of guys know that, and I think it's fair. Women go through menopause. Uh, I had a guest on this show talking about andropause, which is apparently a thing also. So all of this focus on our health, not just to stay alive, live longer, feel better, but to be more attractive and better in our relationships with women really is profoundly important. And there's so many angles to approach this from. It seems almost intimidating. And indeed, a 900-page book, dude, that's that's heavy. That's a thumper. <laughs> That'll leave a mark when you drop it on the table. So I'm assuming that this is an encyclopedic volume rather than something you'd read like a, a Hardy Boys novel. Yeah, no, it's, it's not meant to be read front to back. Uh, what I would suggest is read the introduction, read the first chapter, go through the table of contents, which is eight pages. And then pick and choose the chapters that are most relevant to you. And I can tell you as the person that wrote about 30 or 40 of the chapters and edited every single chapter that this is a 900-page book that the least number of pages it could be written is 900 pages. The thing that I can't stand is if you read like a 300-page book and at the end of the day you're like, there's about two pages of information in here. There's like literally 900 pages of information in this book, but it's written in kind of a fun, a fun way. I have quotes and jokes and stories, and uh, I, I think you'll really relate to the way that it's written because most of the authors are men over the age of 50. Oh, so it's written in a way that's free of medical jargon. You're not trying to impress us with all of your medical textbook knowledge. You're talking to us like men – who are expecting to get real actionable advice out of this thing and know what to do with it. I think that's yeah. great. Yeah. I mean, it's not a C-spot run book. If you want a C-spot run book, don't pick this book up. But, <laughs> but you know, You're not I, insulting our intelligence. Yeah, I, I don't want to insult people's intelligence. I have a lot of respect for men and men's intelligence. And if, if a man puts his mind to wanting to understand and learn something, then this is a great book for you because there's incredible – density of information in this book. But if you're looking for a C-spot run type book, this is not it. <laughs> I think that's fair enough. The one thing I would add to the discussion on men's mental and emotional health is, first of all, you're no less of a man for acknowledging it. I would argue you're more of one. And this is coming from the perspective of getting to know some guys who are true badasses guys like Navy SEALs, and hearing them talk about this holistic approach and how important it is. The three Navy SEALs I've coached personally, and I know several others on a personal level, they're all about gaining information. They're not about their egos. I mean, egos kill on the battlefield. I mean, they're deadly to oneself on the battlefield. And the more information we get, the better we are, the more personally powerful we are. And those guys are information gathering machines 
and they are incredibly well acquainted with the holistic nature of health and personal power. I mean, you don't get through Hell Week and Bud's training unless your emotions, your physicality, and your brain are all in sync. Even your spirit, you got to have everything working. All the cylinders have to be firing. And so it's just flat out silly, Judson, for us as guys to think we're too cool for that or too good for that or it doesn't matter or we have to shoulder everybody's burdens or else we're not macho enough. Absolutely. So that's my two cents there. You know, so I'm looking at your the mountaintop logo and I have this concept that I talk to men about, which is kind of like the Maslow's pyramid for midlife men. Ha, nice. So at the base of the Maslow's pyramid is your physical being. Right. So you have to have good testosterone. You have to be muscular. You have to be uh, physically fit. You have to eat well. Above that is your mental health. Right. So you can't be anxious. You can't be depressed. Above that is your emotional health. Above that is your relationship health. And above that, at the very pinnacle, is your sexual health. So if you don't have your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, your relationship health all in line, then you won't hit the top of the pyramid, really, which is where your sexual health comes in. So even talking about how attractive we are to women from a medical perspective is really all moot until we get all that stuff handled. Exactly. I mean, if you're if you have a great opportunity, but you're not physically healthy, things aren't going to go well. You know, if you're in great physical shape, but your relationships are horrible, you won't have that opportunity. Yeah, that all makes good sense. The one last question before we wrap this up is as follows. I think we'd be remiss, Dr. Judson, if we didn't talk about the role of sleep and hydration, because you hear about those factors sometimes, but in my opinion, they're both underrated. I mean, guys are running around on no sleep and we're drinking like way, way less water than we should be. And then we wake up in the morning and we don't understand why we look 85 when we're only 40. You start drinking a gallon of water a day for about a week and a half and you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to be flabbergasted. You're going to look 20 years younger. And you actually carve yourself out seven and a half, eight hours of sleep a night, stick to it, sleep when it's actually dark out. So your circadian rhythms can catch up. And again, you're going to feel better, look better. And of course, that doesn't supplant anything else we talk about here. But there is something to that, isn't there? Yeah. So I'll I'll take on water first. As a urologist, I know a lot about hydration and fluids. Look at your urine. If your urine is a light straw color, you're perfectly hydrated. If it's clear, you're overhydrating. And if it's dark yellow, you're underhydrating. And hydration is important because if you're adequately hydrated, your heart doesn't have to work that hard to pump blood. Which is why if you get good and drunk, your heart rate goes up. Of course, because yeah. alcohol dehydrates you. And man, we're not even going to talk about the kidney stones you get when you start dehydrating yourself. Yeah. And but I let me, wish let that me on take on enemy. sleep. And Go I'm ahead. not a sleep expert, but I've learned a lot about sleep in writing this book and, and some of the other things that I do. There, uh, sleep is a really amazing restorative aspect of our life. So the first third of sleep is just sort of getting into sleep. The second part of sleep is physical rejuvenation. So that's where you build muscle. You don't build muscle in the gym. You build muscle in bed. And the third part of sleep is the psychological restoration. That's where you process all of the crazy events that occur during the day. So if you don't get adequate sleep, you're not going to build muscle and you're not going to be um, in good shape psychologically. Now, another thing that happens during sleep is you get erections, right? I had a 42-year-old patient the other day that had 20-year history of sleep apnea. It comes in with erectile dysfunction, Right. The reason he's having erectile dysfunction is because he's never getting into REM sleep, which is where you get nighttime erections. And if you're not getting nighttime erections, you're not going to get daytime erections. So sleep is important for nighttime erections. And then another really important part of sleep is if you look at your circadian rhythms, your testosterone levels are highest at eight o'clock in the morning and they're lowest starting around three or four o'clock in the afternoon. 
And guess what happens when you go to sleep? Boom, all of a sudden, testosterone levels start to rise again. So you're doing so many important things when you sleep. It's not just, you know, lights out, wake up in the morning. Your body is very active, putting itself back together after a long, hectic day. Man, that's all so powerful. His name is Dr. Judson Brandeis. He's in Northern California, San Ramon, California, to be precise. I've been to San Ramon so many times when I used to work for Lucent because there's a big Pac Bell facility there. A beautiful part of the country, by the way. And he is the author of The 21st Century Man. I have put that book at the top of my Amazon influencer queue, which you can check out by going to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon. And also when you go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Judson, J-U-D-S-O-N, you'll be able to grab a copy of Dr. Judson Brandeis's book as well. Fascinating conversation and one that I think is very relevant to most, if not all, of the men listening to this particular show. Thank you so much, Dr. Judson, for stopping by today. Hey, my pleasure, Scott. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, man. Great show. And gentlemen, I want to talk about my sponsors. Speaking of Navy SEALs, Jocko Willink's company, Origin in Maine, has the best jeans you have ever worn. I haven't talked about them much lately. But listen, those factory jeans, if there's a wait list for those right now. Get on it. It will be worth the wait. These jeans will probably outlast you. They will look great whether you're going to work or whether you're going to play or going out on the town. You can dress them up with a nice shirt or you can get into a bar brawl with them. Either way, we don't recommend the latter, but the jeans aren't going to be part of the problem. They'll be part of the solution either way. When you go to Origin in Maine, please use the coupon code MOUNTAIN10 to get an additional 10% off. You can use that same coupon code when you visit our friends at Keyport. Gentlemen, this is not your dad's or your grandfather's, especially Swiss Army Knife. It is so cool. It is so techy. You just got to go to mountaintoppodcast.com, Keyport, and check out what you can do with your Keyport, how you can build it. It's modular. You can get cool custom faceplates for them. I carry mine everywhere, and I wouldn't leave home without it. It is the ultimate everyday carry device in the 21st century. Use Mountain 10 as the coupon code when you go to Keyport to get 10% off. Last and certainly not least, HeroSoap.com. Hey, you know, we're talking about sexual health here. We're talking about being attractive to women. If you feel sexually confident enough to take buck naked showers with women, and hey, there's no better way to take a shower with a woman than buck naked, right? You absolutely have to have. This is a moral imperative. At least one bottle of Hero Soap's body wash. It is the slinkiest, slipperiest stuff you can imagine. Both of you will be thrilled you took that shower together. They'll probably be thrilled because you're such a good dude to begin with. But hey, this part of the equation definitely will not hurt matters. Once again, you can use Mountain 10 to get you some when you visit mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Hero Soap. Gentlemen, we are doing master classes. We've done the first three. They have all gone spectacularly. And I'll tell you what I'm trying to do with this. I'm trying to cover topics that are absolutely mission critical to you. I'm working hard on the outlines for them. And when the master class comes, we're getting straight to the point and not leaving anything on the table. Men are leaving empowered to transform a major part of their lives simply by attending one master class. Go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash masterclass and see what's cooking this month or next month if you're listening sometime after this show drops. And gentlemen, as always, you can get on my calendar and talk to me free for 25 minutes about where you are right now and what your goals are with the women in your life. I've been coaching men to greatness with women for 16 years now. I want yours to be the next success story. You can get on my calendar and so much more when you go to mountaintoppodcast.com. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for The Mountaintop Podcast.